Um, I think uh, he provided an excellent overview. Um, because we're going to have separate sessions on radiation therapy and EGFR targeted therapies led by uh, Dr. Forstier, as well as a topic on uh, toxicity and quality of life by Dr. Vandenberg, we're going to limit our comments in this session on that and focus on uh, some of the um, next slide, some of the uh, other topics that were touched on by Dr. Vermorka and elaborate a little bit more. Um, so we heard a little bit about a number of the settings, uh, and here I think this was a topic that you treated very well, and it's um, okay, using um, any, so you uh, mentioned, as did Dr. Geralt in his uh, early comments, that there are antibody approaches as well as small molecule inhibitors, and we're going to talk first about the antibodies and then uh, talk a little bit more about the, the small molecules. So. Regarding uh, some of the data that uh, you presented about uh, using single agent in combination cetuximab with chemotherapy uh, for refractory disease, I wanted to get some comments from Dr. Posner about that and sort of where the data st stand. Those were summarized nicely, but also where do we go from here in that area based on the data that we have? Well, I think it's very interesting that uh, despite uh, failure of uh, second-line therapies in general to uh, help patients with recurrent or metastatic head and neck cancer, that tuximab seems to have about a 10 to 15 percent response rate. And given this uh, excellent response rate comparative to other agents uh, and the lack of uh, significant toxicity, we've actually begun using it in our clinic for patients with refractory disease uh, as a palliative therapy. And we've been satisfied in seeing some stability and a few responses, which we find encouraging. Generally, in recurrent disease, uh, outside of a study, uh, we're happy to see stabilization or minimal uh, response in a patient as a, as a victory for them in terms of their quality of life. I'd like to comment on one thing uh, that I observed in, in reading the data and where I, I may or may not be somewhat uh, different in my opinion uh, than Dr. Vermorkin, which is that I, I don't see any synergy between cetuximab and cisplatinum, which is the only agent in which it's really been tested uh, in terms of chemotherapy. What I see is additive uh, results. Uh, and when I see additive results like this, um, it makes me uh, consider the drug perhaps as a second-line treatment rather than something to be given with uh, cisplatinum or cisplatinum 5-FU. It'll be interesting to see whether cisplatinum and carboplatinum are really the right agents to use with cetuximab. It may be that the taxanes uh, might be more efficient and more effective and have some synergy. We know, for example, in looking at the taxanes, the taxane 5-FU is not particularly synergistic, but taxane platinum is synergistic, and taxane platinum 5-FU seems to be uh, synergistic as well, where you get more than super additive uh, results. So uh, my own feeling is that there's not going to be a lot of uh, desire on our part to add it directly to platinum, but it may be useful in combination. And certainly that says nothing about what its re, uh, response rate or synergism might be in terms of uh, additive and synergistic effects with radiation. So a platinum uh, cetuximab combination with radiation may prove to be more effective or perhaps even less effective uh, than uh, the uh, individual agents alone with radiation. Yeah, I think, I think, is this working? I hope so. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think that the data that, that, that I presented to you um, in relation to cisplatin or carboplatin is completely different than the colorectal data where you know that the patients that are refractory to irinotecan, um, when you use both again, you really, you really have uh, an important effect. That is different. I must say that, of course, um, here you're talking about uh, refractory patients. And then it seems to be that giving the drug alone or again with platinum gives you more or less the same result. I don't know how to interpret that exactly. Uh, we have been um, you know, discussing that, whether you can make any assumption what that means exactly. I think that the randomized trial that we are doing, that we have just performed, will give the answer ultimately what the contribution is <coughs> of, um, of cetuximab in addition to platinum. And I hope that the suggestion that was coming forward from, uh, from Burton's trial will be confirmed in this larger um, trial 
to see whether it's a survival benefit, because that's the only thing. I mean, responses alone are not enough to say that this is an enormous contribution. I think you need a survival benefit in order to say that this is really a major uh, advance. I think survival benefit in recurrent refractory disease is a difficult endpoint. Uh, you have a disease which tends to grow rapidly uh, when it becomes immediately resistant, and you really lose the benefit of uh, the uh, effects that you would see, say, in upfront curative treatment, where uh, a response rate in association with uh, a cure actually an improved cure rate will actually give you a, a survival benefit because you're curing more patients. So I think that survival with these kinds of drugs uh, is less of a, an important endpoint perhaps than progression-free survival might be. Uh, and I think that, that in that setting, progression-free survival, the combination, although not significantly better, was better. The one-year survival in Burtness study was better with the combination and uh, the response rate was better. If you look at all of the measures that we have that we use to decide that a drug is useful, uh, everything was better with a combination, uh, including uh, progression-free survival. It was not significantly better, because perhaps because of the small numbers. So you could argue that if response is an important palliative endpoint, that the combination of platinum and cetuximab is useful. Uh, I like to use the combination of uh, platinum and a taxane or platinum and 5-FU for first line, and I would consider this as a second line treatment uh, as single agent myself uh, in clinical practice. I think that kind of responds to your... Right. Well, I think you summarized nicely with your last two slides about where we need to go next yes. with some of these things, but it's a little bit overwhelming faced with the patient to know exactly where to go next, and maybe the two of you could comment on prioritizing these things. Do we take a patient and uh, you know, add a, a different chemo agent? Is that the first best study to do along with cetuximab, or do we study um, uh, the cetuximab with another targeted agent? I think these are, are difficult for us to, to sort out. You ask me, or do you? Well, it's, it's for uh, mainly our medical oncology colleagues, because these are where, so both you and Dr. Posner. Well, um, you know, I think that I, I could imagine that, that why is everyone so enthusiastic is because of the Bonner data, in fact. Um, and so this is um, giving us a lot of um, feeling how to go further, because, you know, we, it will come forward also when we discuss about quality of life. The quality of life of patients being, that are being treated with chemo radiation um, is really a, a major problem. And so um, we have a tendency as doctors uh, that we want to give more and more in order to get, to get a better survival um, or a better response or, or a better local regional control, as they say it, but it's not always the same as a better quality of life for the patients. And also, when we compare our so-called non-surgical treatments with surgical treatments, there is a lot of discussion um, whether that approach continuously is leading to a better quality of life for the patients. And so if we have now an observation that we might have a compound that leads to a better survival for patients, but with an acceptable, an acceptable quality of life, whatever you define it, I think that that is a very important development because it's the first time that you see that. Um, and, now, and you will see that what we are going to do automatically is then combine it with chemo radiation, so it means that the quality of life will go down again. And I, I don't know how to interpret this. I, I think that the best trial would be, and I, I'm not so sure that it will be done, is chemo radiation versus radiation plus cetuximab. Because if that would lead to the same outcome, but with a better quality of life for the patient, that would really uh, be a major advantage. Um, yes and no. I think absolutely there's no question that quality of life uh, in aggressive chemoradiotherapy programs for our patients is significantly worse than the quality of life was with the less aggressive regimens that we were using five to ten years ago. And I think the bulk of the, uh, of the uh, 
reduction in quality of life, the uh, increase in scarring and fibrosis, xerostomia, esophageal stenosis can really be ascribed to use of hyperfractionated radiation and more aggressive radiation protocols, and not merely the addition of cisplatinum or carboplatin, which adds to acute mucositis in some of the uh, toxicity. I think if you look at the uh, patients treated with uh, radiation alone with these aggressive regimens, they have uh, almost an equivalent amount of toxicity, and it's quite severe. But what we have done is we've increased, I think, the survival, despite this, the, the, the a statement at the beginning of this, this, this uh, session that survival hasn't improved. There are some indication that there's a 5 to 10 percent increase in survival now that we're using these better uh, regimens, and that this is probably going to be larger if you look at the patients who are actually robust enough to treat, be treated. We are seeing new agents that are being developed to try and reduce some of the toxicity, and there's no question that if we had equivalent survival with less toxicity, everybody here would grab that therapy with both hands and use it on their patients. Um, but I, if we talk to patients in general, they do not wish to sacrifice uh, survival for swallowing or speech in the long run, and many of them would uh, rather have the survival advantage and have that survival. The, the major thing that they don't want with survival is pain. So they want to be pain-free and survive. And I think we do have a real obligation to try and develop those kinds of treatments for our patients. Um, so I think we have a, we, we've moved the survival of these patients forward quite a bit with our aggressive regimens. Uh, cetuximab, I think, will prove to be uh, fairly uh, useful. but. Uh, I wonder, uh, in the data, we don't have the information as to what subset actually worked, it worked best in. Um, we, the radiation was quite complex and different among all the different uh, patients and sites. So we don't know if the hyperfractionated patients did better with cetuximab or the single fractionated patients did better with the cetuximab or if both did. And what we don't know is whether it was oropharynx cases, which actually do tremendously better with chemoradiotherapy, or whether it was uh, the uh, hypopharynx and larynx where chemoradiotherapy is less effective uh, and in which uh, even all therapy tends to be less effective in terms of a survival advantage for advanced disease. So all of these things have to be addressed and looked at in the studies that will be done. So I think uh, cetuximab looks extraordinarily useful. I think it will be used. I'm using it, uh, but I'm not sure that it replaces chemoradiotherapy at this point. Professor Beer. Well, I could think that one problem to identify the right patient for this kind of therapy exactly. is that there are rather few experimental data on what this antibody is doing. Because when we are looking really closely to all these figures, what does the antibody do? Retards proliferation as soon as you stop the medication, all experimental tumors start to grow again. The big hope did not fulfill that the EGF receptor is crucial for the survival of cancer cells. They, they do very well with blocked EGF receptor. They do not die. They do not undergo apoptosis. There is no sign of real cytotoxicity. So you only have a growth retardation. We have some interesting immunological effects, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity reactions. But as far as to my knowledge, I, I, I can't remember any substance with such mediocre preclinical data which is doing such a great wave in clinical research. And this, I think, I, this is a little bit provocative, but this, I think, is a, is, a, is a basic problem why we are not able really to identify the patient subset where we now should test this, this, this new drug. I think it's not, it's not the third-line therapy where this antibody has its place. Because all, you know better than I do that if we, if we obtain some kind of objective responses in uh, in, 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 in um, well, let's, let's say fatal disease. This hardly has anything to do with survival benefit. You all know these, these very nice protocols when we look, metotrexate, um, uh, monotherapy, 
regard, regarding survival is almost as good as the most toxic combinational chemotherapy. So I think the, the, the interesting question would be what kind of experimental data do we have to include cetuximab or any other anti-EGFR treatment modality into first-line treatment strategies, either before we do surgery and radiotherapy or in an interesting adjuvant setting. I think that's the main point as far as I can judge this. Yeah, I think you've brought up an important question that I wanted to ask, and it really ties into our first session. You know, we uh, present these elegant signaling pathway uh, diagrams, and it's maybe more relevant to the small molecule TKIs of what's going on inside the cell, but for these receptors that target, uh, these antibodies that target the receptors on the cell surface, is this immunotherapy? I think there's growing data on the CRB2, uh, system that maybe the dramatic effects we see in vivo but not in vitro in the preclinical studies suggest that it's an anti-angiogenic effect or else an immunotherapy effect and maybe ask a, one of our immunologists on the panel to discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have some comments about that? No. Uh, I, uh, well first uh, we don't know how many drugs work uh, in terms of the actual decision-making as to what drug actually will be effective in a patient. So we use 5-FU. There's some suggested data that thymidylate synthase levels might be important in that. So it, it, we, we, but we have a better handle on the mechanism of action of 5-FU than we have on cetuximab. We have no clue how it really works. And A431 cells, which we sh were shown in the slide, are really not an, uh, an appropriate model for what goes on in a very rich environment in vivo in patients where there are many support structures that permit these and, and cytokines that permit these cells to grow. What we do know is that in lung cancer there are clearly defined uh, uh, mutations in which gefitinib uh, is quite effective and there is an improvement in survival. We don't have any indication as to what governs that in head and neck cancer other than that the rash does suggest that there's a, an, an improvement in stable disease and response rate, which suggests that there's an intrinsic genetic difference between those patients who respond and those patients who don't, which is not based on the tumor, but based on the germline genetics uh, of the patient. And that may be a, a pharmacodynamic problem or it may be a pharmacokinetic issue. Uh, that being said, if we look at the response rate to single agents in recurrent disease in head and neck cancers, where we do get some real palliation, the best agents, the taxanes, run about 30 percent. The combinations, which are fairly toxic, run about 25 to 30 percent also uh, in general in randomized phase three trials. But in second line, they're almost nil. And I do, I do argue uh, that, a, a, that a response rate of 10 to 15 percent is actually a benefit to, to patients with some stabilization. And although we can't demonstrate a dramatic uh, uh, survival advantage, I think it's hard to do so when you have, when you have response rates of under 50 percent. Um, and I think if you do meta-analysis where you can get a handle on relatively small differences, I think a, a meta-analysis of recurrent disease would probably show that chemo chemotherapy in patients and probably combination chemotherapy is effective in improving survival, as it showed an improvement for chemoradiotherapy for upfront treatment. What we use in the recurrence setting is the indication of response or stabilization to make decisions about how to bring a drug forward in the curative setting. And I think that uh, we would look for uh, lesser responses than we get in the upfront setting. A, a response rate of 80 or 90 percent may not actually translate into a, a major cure improvement without additional uh, uh, treatments being added. I mean, we see with PF uh, a 5 percent improvement in uh, survival at five years. We see with chemoradiotherapy a 8 percent improvement in survival at five years in patients who are being treated. So we're seeing very small differences that become significant. Uh, as you incrementally add them together. And I think we are seeing an improvement in, in survival and curative patients by adding these things together and trying to get a more aggressive, uh, or at least um, uh, chemo-aggressive, radiation and chemo-aggressive regimen, not necessarily toxic, different between toxicity and aggressiveness. Oh, I th I'm not impressed. Okay, I don't blame <laughs> you. Well, I'm a head and neck surgeon, so I, I see and follow all my patients, which went all through different disciplines, you know. Yeah. That's, um, but my, I, my, my principal point was that there's a discrepancy between yes. preclinical data and clinical data. And you are, well, you are, you are longer in this business than I am, but did we ever experience that with a 
with a drug that this performs better in the clinic than in the preclinical models? A drug performing better in the clinic than the preclinical models? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, only in drugs that don't work in animals because their metabolism is not okay. the same. Um, and uh, I think we can cure many cancers in mice easily. And I think when you think in terms of the models, uh, in terms of particularly angiogenesis, uh, I could fit an entire mouse into the cavity of a necrotic head and neck tumor. I think the <laughs> dynamics of the vasculature in uh, the mouse tumor models is quite different than the dynamics of the vasculature in human tumors. And I think we really have to look at the model of relevance, which is human beings. In vitro models are less effective in telling us how to use a drug in the clinic than in vivo models, and animal models are less effective than actually testing them in people. Uh, that being said, there is good evidence that one of the things that happens with EGF receptor inhibition by the antibodies is a change in P27, uh, which leads to uh, increased quiescence and uh, senescence in the, in the tumor cells. Uh, the other thing that may happen with this molecule is that you uh, decrease the survivability of the cells after another insult rather than actually attack them. And when you have drugs that do that, uh, then you really uh, have to look at uh, the combination models to find efficacy. Um, I'll give you an example of a drug that doesn't work in head and neck cancer by itself, but is used as a radiation synergizer, hydroxyurea, which the uh, Chicago group has demonstrated to be highly effective synergistically with radiation, but it has absolutely no activity by itself in head and neck cancer. We did a phase two trial many years ago, and it was dead negative. Uh, and yet it seems to be synergistic. So you can separate the synergism between agents from their direct antitumor activity. And another example of that would be uh, taxanes. Uh, taxane by itself, if you develop a tumor resistance to taxane, uh, you do not inhibit one bit the radiation sensitization effect of the taxanes. So it's completely uh, preserved, even though the tumor may be primarily resistant. So there are models, and there are actually effects in human beings where you can see these kinds of things. So. I, I learn more every time I, 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 I try and figure out what's going on and discover that my preconceptions or my, my thoughts are, 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 are not quite uh, in line with what we actually see in the patients. So, I but. think these are excellent points. And while the title of this whole morning, uh, part of the symposium is targeted therapy, I think while we have this idea of rational drug design and the pathways that we're inhibiting, you're absolutely right. When we put them into our experimental model of patients, it becomes empiric therapy again, and it gives us a, a challenge of trying to unravel this in the laboratory and learn more uh, about other ways that we can uh, utilize these agents. Um, I would uh, like to ask a question now. There's we'll talk mainly about uh, cetuximab, and there's a lot of excitement, and we'll hear more about that today. Um, what about some of the other antibodies that target the EGF receptor? I know Professor Beer has worked on at least another antibody, and now there's this Abgenix, a fully humanized monoclonal antibody. And I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Gerald if you have experience with these other <laughs> antibodies. And uh, if yes, you want to comment in, on those, in fact, we, we in combination with Jan, we we are we have start a phase one uh, trial, combined panitutumab, the fully humanized antibody, with uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then uh, with uh, concurrent chemoradiotherapy with carbapatin, and also with in uh, another arm with an antiogenic. Uh, agent in combination is, uh, is uh, located for locally, really unresectable, locally advanced patients. And uh, I think that this strategy could be very, very interesting to know the combinations because from my point of view, when we are dealing with locally advanced head and neck cancer, now stage three and four are in, in most of the trials together, and now we have to move in a new step that we have to separate what is really a T4 and, and, and T3, T4, and 2 and 3 patient for maybe a T3, 1. This, I think that these are different stories, and we have to, to, we have to put these patients in different trials. 
And for these very locally advanced head and neck cancer patients, I, I think that a new adjuvant chemotherapy is useful, has been well demonstrated. And then the use of this new statistician combination, and in these patients especially, the survival uh, curves are really uh, really bad, so we, we, we have to, to, to try to, to incorporate new strategies, and I think that uh, this strategy we will see with time, but it has a lot of sense and probably could be very useful. So Dr. Beer, thank you. Is it your sense that we should keep pushing on C225, which we have so much promising data with, or study the, uh, the other uh, more fully humanized uh, monoclonal antibody? What, what would be your recommendation at this time? Well, in pre clinical models, we have looked uh, uh, into several phenomena with uh, mouse monoclonal antibody, rat monoclonal antibody, this group from Helmut Machtehedi from the UK has uh, produced a lot of uh, different very uh, promising red antibodies and a fully humanized antibody. We never worked with C225. And in vitro, there was hardly a major difference with the exception of immunological phenomena. But this is a question of the subtype of immunoglobulin which you use. And um, in the discussion, I think the most or which is used to favor in particular C225 is that we have this very interesting phenomenon of skin rash. We have never observed this in our patients which were treated with a mouse monoclonal or with a fully uh, humanized antibody. So this appears to be a very particular phenomenon with C225 and so far nobody was able to explain this to me. But then the surrogate idea from this was well normally only things can work which have some kind of side effects. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> this is a very, um, well, no, it's not an oncologic point of view, I think. No, it's not. It's, um, um, but this, this is one of, one of the arguments I always uh, have to, 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 to argue against. This is, this is not obvious for me. Why is a substance better than another substance just because it has a, a defined um, side effect which apparently has a predictive um, 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 relevance for the response to this antibody. So that's a very interesting point. But as far as I know, it's just uh, who was first in the clinical setting, who was quicker. I think that's, that's the main issue why the one antibody is now in the forefront and the other is a little bit set back. Um, there is still a small immunological problem because even C225, I think, has enough mouse protein to give rise for human anti-mouse antibodies and I don't know how this interferes with antibody effects, I don't know this. The uh, humanized antibody has no antibody production in these patients. On the other hand, the mouse monoclonal definitely has. So these are small differences but basically they should not interfere with the major uh, idea behind this treatment that you block a crucial signal in the tumor cell. The, you know, I, I'm not clear that it actually is by blocking the, the signal so much as it might be downregulation of the receptor. There are differences in the antibodies. For example, R24, which is the Cuban antibody, uh, has what's called a low affinity. That means that it doesn't bind tightly to its target. So if EGFR is circulating, it won't bind to it. It'll only bind to high expressed EGFR on the surface of cells where it can bind to both, to two molecules at a time. Um, similarly, the uh, panitumumab antibody has a different pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic profile. It has a higher affinity than C225, and it has a longer half-life, so it can be given every three weeks, and it's associated with an extensive rash in, in the patients in general. Uh, from what I understand, I've not given it to anybody. Um, I'm not familiar with the antibody out of the Netherlands uh, as to what its rash association is, uh, but I know that it has some activity in the phase one studies. Um, and uh, there's another antibody, EMD72000, uh, which is also in clinical trials. And I'm not familiar with the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of that. But there are subtle differences between antibodies. Uh, as you've mentioned, isotypes are very important uh, for function. 
uh, that is the, the kind of antibody, an IgG1 or an IgG2, uh, but also the orientation of the antibody, whether it separates the, uh, the targets uh, from each other so that they can't um, uh, autophosphorylate, whether it causes downregulation. I'll point out that there are many rituximab-type antibodies that were tested, but there are only two that actually made it towards the clinic that were effective in lymphomas. Uh, and what we have here are a number of antibodies that work in, in, in model systems, which people are now bringing into the clinic, which might have some subtle differences in the way they work or subtle advantages, just as the taxanes are different and the platinums are different uh, and the adromycin molecules are different and have different effects in different diseases. We may see some differences here that will prove to be advantageous for our patients. I think a, a broader choice is uh, always a little bit better. Um, with regard to toxicity, I'd love to give anything that doesn't have any toxicity. <laughs> uh, I'll point out that I think many of the uh, small molecule inhibitors are probably a little too targeted. Um, and I think that we're seeing that there are now several uh, that are multi, what we call dual kinase inhibitors or multi kinase inhibitors, where you see multiple uh, targets. This is going to be different than the antibodies, which won't have that kind of uh, potential efficacy. On the other hand, uh, it's thought that, uh, for example, the uh, ERB2 receptor, er 2 nu is not effective unless it's combined with EGFR1. So blocking EGFR1 with a, a higher affinity molecule, such as C2D5 or uh, penetumumab compared to R24, might be a more effective agent than this. So there's some, a lot of modeling, a lot of molecule, molecular uh, uh, immunology that can be looked at to evaluate these. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about antibodies, and uh, unfortunately I've left us little time to talk about the small molecule inhibitors, which you just touched on. I guess I would uh, think there was a lot of initial enthusiasm about the, the single targeted uh, small molecule inhibitors like gefitinib and erlotinib, but uh, as we now have some agents that will also target VEGF receptor family members, et cetera, I think there's now a renewed enthusiasm to study those. I'd ask Dr. Vermorkin to maybe comment a little bit on those combined inhibitors and where we stand with those and where we need to go. Well, I think that um, the data, as they have been presented recently at, uh, um, at for instance, at ASCO, um, is showing that there is a, a clear uh, suggestion that there may be synergistic effects between different groups of drugs, and you're mentioning um, the VEGF uh, um, inhibitors um, and also the EGFR inhibitors. I mean, I showed you the data that were presented by um, um, Everett Vokes. I, th I was quite impressed, I must say, about, about the combination of EGFR inhibitors and COX-2. Um, that was, um, the response rate was quite impressive, this 22 percent is something that I had not expected, in fact. We were surprised, but uh, we had decided to look at the COX-2 because of the impact on the NF-kappa B uh, in pro-inflammatory pathway. When we combined uh, gefitinib plus uh, celecoxib, we actually had very incredible responses. We had people throw, literally throw away their crutches and do things that they hadn't done for months. Uh, and unfortunately, when they relapsed, they relapsed and died fairly quickly. But it, it was unfortunate that the uh, molecule gefitinib took a double hit uh, in this study. First, the uh, lung studies uh, really uh, did not pan out, uh, and then uh, the uh, COX-2 inhibitors received an extremely big black eye that is now uh, the, uh, with the cardiac uh, side effects. But I think that effect was real, and we were unable to actually do a randomized phase two or a phase three to assess this because of the, uh, the political industrial issues around these agents. I think a 10 to 15 percent response rate with gefitinib is quite robust. Uh, it's, not, it's not been compared head-to-head to, -head to uh, C225, but there is a gefitinib trial that's ongoing comparing gefitinib plus or minus uh, other agents as a, as a primary therapy, and it will be interesting to see whether this trial demonstrates potential efficacy. And here again is a drug which has very few side effects. I mean, we had some patients with diarrhea that's a quite controllable. Uh, and we had some people on these drugs for you know, quite a long time with really legitimate responses. So I'm very pleased with the EGFR receptors in general, the inhibitors, both the TKIs and the antibodies as being something that we will be using in the clinic. And hopefully we'll be able to combine with other agents for cure and even for adjuvant therapy. We, we have tried 
to look at uh, gefitinib plus uh, celecoxib as a uh, adjuvant treatment for patients or as a treatment for pre-malignancy uh, and to study that model. And unfortunately, uh, because of the, uh, the side effect profile that celecoxib developed, uh, we were unable to really uh, get the permission to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, given um, the, uh, uh, the difficulty in predicting who with a premalignant lesion actually has a premalignancy, uh, those studies are extremely difficult to accomplish. Um, given that 20% of leukoplakias regress on their own uh, and only 20% actually progress to actual cancer, uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to determine. Those are huge, become huge studies to determine whether something's really effective or not. This is a model problem where surrogate markers are really unavailable. Dr. Cottrell, do you have comments on some of these other small molecule inhibitors and uh, radiation or combination uh, targeted agents with radiotherapy? Yes, uh, there has been a study in combination COX-2 inhibitors in lung cancer, and uh, the results were there, we, there is also a, 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 an enhancement effect. There were there were preclinical pre data, and, and this has been studied in cancer. But as far as I know, because this was done in, in MD Anderson, the, the trial, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think that they won't continue, but maybe because of the toxicity of the helicopter. Sure. I'm not sure. Well, I think that these combinations of, uh, of agents is a particularly interesting for patients. Um, with uh, metastatic um, recurrent disease because um, we are always talking about the fact that, that you sometimes see patients in a better condition than we do, but here in Europe uh, quite a lot of patients are older and in a poor condition where this combined chemotherapy is not very attractive. Yes. And I think that especially in these patients um, testing these combinations which with less toxicity for them may be a very good group of patients to, uh, to test this. I, I want to point out that in my own practice, when I have a patient who's not going on a study and is palliative, I tend to use a very low-dose weekly therapy, which is relatively non-toxic, right. because my aim is to palliate and not to right. uh, damage the patient more. So our aim is really to treat uh, patients and first and then to learn how to treat patients better second. And I think that's very important, you know, and you're right. Well, I think we're at the end of our hour, so I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for their comments and their expertise, and just take a moment to summarize clearly by this discussion. We could uh, talk all day probably just about EGFR uh, targeted therapies, and fortunately we have an, uh, a couple more sessions devoted to specific aspects of them, because I think there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm here and interesting uh, results. I think they're here to stay for a while. Uh, while they're targeting EGFR, we don't really understand exactly what aspect and how they're working, and that provides further opportunity to learn about them as well as potentially other new agents that will develop uh, from this. I think there are a number of settings that were summarized well in Dr. Vermorkin's uh, closing slide that we need to test this. I think uh, having gone this year to the combined EORTC and AACR meeting, there are so many exciting molecules out there, and it's uh, going to be important for us as a community to work together to go through the systematic study of these agents in, in the proper order and not jump from agent to agent as each has uh, new enthusiasm, because as we use these in different combinations, as we've heard about EGFR inhibitors with COX-2 inhibitors in combination, we might uh, learn interesting things about each one of these uh, compounds. So uh, we look forward to continued studies, and I'm sure at the next statements on head and neck cancer, there will be a lot more to talk about. So thank you.